So good evening, everyone, and welcome to this master class on lung oscillometry. So Indian Chest Society has been breaking barriers and breaking records, and you have been through many different webinars. Uh, this is a wonderful webinar, which I'm sure it's going to help me as well as all the wonderful doctors who have logged in, because we have got wonderful uh, panelists and speakers with us. And this initiative is by Indian Chess Society. And I should mm -hmm. absolutely th thank right at the beginning, Dr. Sandeep Sarvi, sir, President ICS, Dr. Rajadhar, the Secretary ICS, and Dr. Amita, who has been the chair of TEI, the ICS, and has been actively getting us all together. So thank you, wonderful, uh, all of you for uh, initiating this, and of course, inviting me to be a part of this, and Lupin for the educational support, for the support of going through the technical work behind the force which goes on for this webinar. So with that, we are going to be immediately starting off because there are a lot of people who have already logged in and uh, what I've got the information is crossed already the thousand number. So lung oscillometry, as we all know, is not anymore the new kid on the block. It's growing up in stature, growing up in height and growing up in maturity. Uh, spirometry has been with us for a long time and oscillometry is gradually making inroads. But there are many issues, many doubts, many apprehensions related to this particular topic. And we have got experts, international experts as well as our own experts who will guide us through these intricacies of interpreting, of applying this knowledge of oscillometry to clinical practice. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, he's a fantastic orator, fantastic academician. You can see his uh, uh, resume right now. Dr. Lennart, Associate Professor at the Mikens Christie Labs at the McGill University and the Director of Clinical Sciences at Thoracis. Internationally recognized in the pathogenesis of lung diseases. I will not read everything, but the most important highlights of extensive publications in peer-reviewed journals uh, for his research, and of course, a PhD in clinical experiment physiology from Sweden. He's a mentor to medical students, as well as postgraduates and fellows. He's a member of the American Physiological Society and American Thoracic Society, and has served on the conference planning committee for the respiratory structure and function assembly. And his present and current research interests are focused on understanding how oscillation mechanics, a very important subject, uh, can be used in the diagnosis of lung diseases as well as monitoring disease progression and effects of intervention. So I'm uh, really happy and it's our pleasure, Dr. Lennart, that you are going to be a part of this uh, seminar, webinar, which is going to help us. We are waiting for your talk to gain more knowledge from you. So welcome, Dr. Leonard, and please, you can proceed with your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's it's a great, great pleasure and honor to be invited to join you here. Um, and um, let's see if screen sharing will start here. Yes, it does, right? OK. Do, do you see a sailboat? <laughs> Uh, yes, it's uh, visible. Good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. That's what you should be seeing right now. Um, yes. Is it yours, Lennart? Yes. What? Okay, go on, go on. E everything's fine. Okay, great. Um, yeah, because I, I'm not really sure what I'm sharing. That's the problem. All right. So, without further ado, um, uh, let's move on. Uh, I was invited to talk about current and future applications of lung oscillometry. And this is kind of an interesting thing because it really behooves on us as scientists to understand what is going to happen in the future, which, of course, we all know is impossible to, to predict. But I'm going to take a stab at it, and I, I find that a very intriguing and, and uh, interesting topic. So um, we'll see where we end up. Uh, first, some disclosures. Uh, I do have a, an employment uh, with Thoracis, as just mentioned, uh, own a very tiny sliver of shares there. Um, and today I'm wearing my McGill hat. So this will be an academic presentation. Um, so we all recognize the small airways. That's where the problems 
live reside and that is what eventually is going to kill you if you suffer from serious lung disease um and it was coined the silent zone many many years ago because people knew that's where the problems are but they couldn't really do much about it because um there were no ways of really measuring what's happening there so it's more sort of after the fact uh, finding in 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 and, um, autopsies and things like that, that uh, this was the case. So we need to understand that this is really the, the big question for, for most of us. Of course, there are diseases affecting the large airways too, and there will be diseases uh, affecting the very proximal parts of, uh, of the lungs. But uh, for the most part, if we can detect things while they are happening here, we might be able to, to take care of problems. So the traditional way of looking at oscillometry is really sort of more of a technological, almost engineering approach. You know, we deliver the test signal, there's minimal effort, it's quick, it's easy, and so on and so forth. I, I would say that it's it's also important to, to recognize that the parameters, for all the hesitations, <laughs> I respect that, I would claim that the parameters are very intuitive and should be easy to understand with, you know, a minimal of, of effort. We do get small errors in for which is important as it relates to the previous slide. What we are uh, in achieving in terms of data is model-based. That means that we have a relationship with string structure and function of the lung. And that enables us to say something about where, or at least approximately where the problems might reside and also if they are resolved by treatment, for example. Um, I would also claim that it's an excellent monitoring tool because it is very simple to use uh, with, with uh, relatively little training. And it will also aid with diagnosis. So these are the two things that people you know, will come to see doctors for. They will have, want to have a diagnosis. Once they have that, they want to be monitored. So, um, just a quick quick recap here. I'm not going to delve into this in, in any detail, but what we are doing with oscillometry is to essentially test how changes of airway flow and airflow and air volumes are impeded in the airways. It's really how do we move air in and out? But rather than having to rely upon the patient uh, providing this um uh, the, the, the mechanics to do this, as we do with spirometry and to some extent also in a body box. We now have a machine doing it for us. So this machine, the oscillator, will deliver a, a an oscillating signal uh, that can take on some different shapes depending on the device you're using, but they sort of, the bottom line, they work very similarly. These frequencies are different, fre are, are different frequencies and that allows us to understand what is going on in the whole lung or maybe more limited to the large airways and somewhere in between the smaller airways. Um, all of this goes back to a wonderful publication. And this is, I would say, a must read for anybody who has the slightest interest in oscillometry. Go and find this one from JAP 1956 by Arthur Otis. It's a wonderful paper. It has a lot of math in it, but it's still, it's, yeah. he's really, really good at um at telling a story. So it's easy and very nice read. And, and you will have a really super understanding of oscillometry after reading this paper. Um, so that's my recommendation. The outcome parameters we are playing around with are uh, typically, I would say, R5. In children, it's typically R7. Um, we do have a mid-frequency measurement point uh, around 20 hertz, 19, 20 hertz, depending on devices. The difference between the low frequency and the high frequency reflects on heterogeneous heterogeneity, homogeneity of the air movement in and out of the airways. So in a healthy lung, this should be homogeneous, in which case this is a straight line. In this example here, this would probably reflect some, some kind of disease. Um, we also look at what is called the airspace um, derecumbent ventilation defects. AX. Now, AX is interesting because it's really an integration of the area over this reactance curve here, and it has the units of elastance. And elastance is nothing but lung stiffness. 
So an increase in this value will actually mean that the lung is now stiffer and a stiff lung is not a healthy lung. So at the end of the day, we are usually looking at these two as the main outcomes in a lot of cases. Heterogeneity, that's not normal for a healthy adult. Uh, having a stiff lung is definitely not normal. So these things are the, or these parameters are the, sort of, I would say the most sensitive ones and the ones that are used the most. So now let's bring out the, the um, crystal ball here. And now, so this is my turn to go out on the thin ice here. Um, and I, I just sat down and, and started thinking, okay, what is it about medical technology, which of course oscillometry is one part of? Well, um, it is a way of <clears throat> doing things that that um, uh, sort of detaches us from depending on the patient. So um, it will be a more objective way of assessing uh, the health status of the body, no matter what you're measuring, be that blood pressure or, or lung function. Mm -hmm. But we are trying to offer the help to the patient and the healthcare providers by providing this device that can be uh, uh, much easier to use. Um, the complexity in our case, the oscillometry, lies with the device. If you depend on the patient, well, then you have the complexity with the patient. So in, in spirometry, we leave all the complex things to the patient. You have to perform your utmost and you have to follow these instructions or whatnot. And we depend on that being the, the signal. Whereas if we use technology instead, we will actually take care of the complexities and the patient just need to sit there and breathe, which we are usually pretty good at. So we need to remove the fright of new technology and try to understand that the technology is actually helping us. Um, and we need to eliminate the mystery of understanding physiology. I think this is a sort of modern problem in a way because we have historically been teaching a lot of physiology in med school and in biology. I'm a biologist uh, from the, the beginning. And so I studied a lot of physiology, but that has sort of skewed over to becoming more of immunology, cell biology, um, and so on and so forth. Nothing wrong. We need to have that too. But at the same time, physiology sort of fell by the wayside. Now we're realizing that what the patients really care about is not if their eosinophils are, are, are making a mess or if their IL-13 is uh, gone away. They mm. care about, oh, I have a hard time breathing. So we need to reintroduce the understanding of physiology. This has also become a natural and integrated part of our healthcare. And if it's not, well, then doctors will not understand what's uh, what the patient's problems are, and the patient will probably lack trust in the doctor. More care, I think, in the future will be de delivered at home. I happened to listen to another webcast the other day, actually, where somebody elaborated on this and saying that, well, in most developed countries um, or countries with a, a, a good healthcare system, we don't want people in the hospitals because it, for, first of all, it's risky to be in a hospital. You get sick in a hospital, right? But people cost money once they step inside the doors of a hospital. It takes time away from other patients that might need the doctors and the healthcare providers' attention much more than somebody coming in with a whatever simple cough or whatever it is, or just to have a new prescript, prescription. So I think more healthcare will be delivered in the home in the future, whether we like it or not. I'm not trying to take away your job, but I think this is in the crystal ball. Um, healthcare will thus be much more of an integrated part of our lives in the future. It is already there with these smart watches and apps we have on our phone, um, keeping track on how many steps we take per day or how far we run, the blood pressure and so on and so forth. At the end of this, just to, teasing a bit to loop in here maybe, I think all this will also help clinical trials. It will make them more effective and more precise. And and uh, that's also a sort of a, another benefit of uh, what's happening with the medical technology advancements. All right, so 
Now we're going to go into the more specifics about oscillometry here. Why? Well, I already mentioned the small airways disease, of course. I think this will provide an important, a very important piece of the puzzle in, in helping with a good diagnosis. Um, because if, if you have a good grip on what is working, not grip, uh, working, you can actually titrate the, the treatment much more uh, to that particular patient's needs. Remember, we are in an era of more personalized medicine. Bronchodilator test might be a, a good way of determining asthma control, which I will touch upon in a moment. Hyperresponsiveness testing is something that in some parts of the world is used extensively, in other parts of the world, not so common. And my impression is that it's not so common in India as it might be in other countries. So this, this has more to do with culture than anything else and uh, you know traditions and such. Um, we need high quality clinical studies and those have to deliver objective measurements that are not influenced uh, by whomever is doing the, the measurements or the, the doing the tests. So for, for the, the industry, this is important. So they can tailor their um, clinical studies to their needs and not overdo them in terms of size, yet have high quality uh, data coming out of them. Um, Another thing I will touch upon is that we also need at least to start with, try to separate obstructive from restrictive lung diseases. Uh, as it turns out, that can sometimes be, be somewhat difficult. Um, so this is on the diagnosis side. Look here, monitoring. Well, the monitoring is really what you do most of the time. Diagnosing is something we typically do like once and, and uh, then we know that this patient has asthma, he has COPD, he has cystic fibrosis, whatever it is. Now comes the time to do monitoring. And monitoring, of course, should not be something that takes half a day. It should be something that you can do very quickly and easy and not uh, do the full workup once, once more. So I think that's where oscillometry would play a big role. Self-monitoring is something we're going to talk about briefly. Early warning, wouldn't that be wonderful? Because if you monitor with some sort of regularity, hopefully that will give you an early warning sign that something is going wrong and you need to change your treatment or whatever. Um, again, monitoring is important in high quality clinical studies because rather than just doing a measurement before and after treatment, maybe do several uh, measurements during the treatment to follow and see what's really happening. Uh, and that is that is going on as we speak actually. And this is important in a, to enable us to titrate treatment again. So you can see there's a lot of overlap between both diagnosing and, and monitoring. They, they do actually have uh, things they share. Yeah. All right, let's start here with assessing asthma control. So first of all, baseline lung function measurements are fine. And we can do that with spirometry, we can do it with oscillometry. That, that, that doesn't really matter, you know, whatever is working. But now talking about oscillometry, um, if you do that only once, well, you're still left with the question, what's happening in between those half year, you know, uh, seeing the doctor. Um, the problem with the lung, I mean, the, the problem for, for us as, <laughs> as trying to understand what's going on is that the lung has a lot of redundant capacity. It has so much um, extra capacity that it often, I mean, I've seen publications saying that somewhere between 50 and 60% of the lungs of the lung has to be affected before the patient really starts complaining. We can adapt to a lot of, of bad changes in the lungs before we really start suffering. So that means that, well, now we have a, an organ that is highly, um, you know, impeded by, by disease and it might be too late to go back and, and uh, cure that. So the trick is to, to challenge the system in one way or the, another. And, you know, essentially there are two ways of doing this for, for lungs. Either you try a reversibility test, bronchodilator test, or the other way is to constrict the lung, you know, doing hyperresponsiveness test. Um, and um, so these are the, the three ways of doing it. Baseline, 
reversibility in hyper-responsiveness test. <clears throat> so here we can look at um, a, a report that came out uh, just uh, two years ago from Denver. And they are uh, interested in using oscillometry in the emergency room. Uh, the idea is to uh, check the kids frequently during their stay in the emergency room and decide whether they should go home or if they need to be admitted to the floor. Again, the point is to keep people out of the hospital. If they don't need to be in the hospital, they should go home. In the USA, this is also implication for parents because they need to take time off and they might be losing their job and whatnot if they have a sick kid. That's a tragic fact in the United States. What we can see here is that improved lung function here is actually that this value goes down. We're looking at Z, Z scores here. So the kids come in, they have a high Z score. They are treated with whatever they are treated. This is, of course, individual in the ER. And they come down. And you can see here that the resistance came down to right around zero. So this was an improvement. And they did so within a couple of hours. Without oscillometry, they might have been sitting there maybe for half a day. And here we have uh, the reactants. Um, I believe this is reactants at five hertz. Either way, the, the set scores that goes uh, in, uh, in a similar direction. And you can see that they're now approaching the, the lower limit of normal here. So this is improved lung function. Um, I think it's worth to note that the variability is big when people are exacerbating. When they're under treatment, the variability will be reduced. So this speaks to this heterogeneity uh, parameter R5 minus 20 or R5 minus 19 that we talked about before. Here's another interesting case, um, patient home monitoring. Again, an asthma case. This is a teenager in Australia. Uh, and um, let me guide you through this um, somewhat complex graph here. The, um, purple bars here are uh, when the patient took their drug. So they had smart inhalers registering when people actually took their drugs. You can see this kid was pretty good at uh, taking his drugs, you know, early on here. Then he started uh, dropping out of that habit. Um, the red dots here are resistance at 5 hertz. Uh, the blue are reactants at 5 hertz. So you can see when the child is taking his drugs with at least some regularity, Everything seems to be in control. It's right around where he should be. The normal values are indicated by the dotted lines here. However, when he or she started skimping on the drug, what happens? Well, you can see that there's a trend, of course, for the resistance to increase and reactance to decrease. However, what is really striking to me is that the variability goes up. There are days when he or she is perfectly normal, interspersed with days when things are pretty horrible. So going from a resistance of about four or so up to 10, that's noticeable for anybody. Eventually things got so bad, it was called exacerbation. Um, and eventually the, the doctor reinforced the need to have good adherence to taking your drugs, which should not be, you know, <laughs> should not be needed to be told, but that's the way it is. I think it's also interesting to notice here that once you've been up here, it is actually pretty hard to come back to a perfectly normal state. You need to stick with your treatment in order to keep this going. So monitoring, which I think this is a good example of, in the home maybe, at least for some severe cases, could be really, really important in the future. Um, Reversibility testing, why use that? Well, I think if you are reversible, that means that there's room for improvement. So this is reversibility on top of your regular treatment. It could indicate you had inadequate treatment. Maybe you got the totally wrong drug. Maybe you have something, some type of, of whatever disease that is um, not treated optimally. It could just be a simple dose adjustment. You need to increase your dose of steroids. I don't know. Could be just changing adding uh, some modality, could be getting rid of the cat or the parrot or whatever keep it, people keep at home, something that, that triggers your allergy. So all of these things are, are important to understand. Um, lack of reversibility could actually indicate a permanent, or, permanent or, or, or fixed obstruction uh, or maybe even COPD. So reversibility testing is, is revealing. 
Some people could start with asthma, but for whatever reason, later on in life, develop a COPD component. So um, it will help with the <clears throat> further sort of added diagnosis. So this is a paper from uh, Australia again, Alice Cotti is the first author. And <clears throat> Of, um, go along the similar lines using bronchodilators in order to understand how asthma is working. I think it's a very interesting paper because they show that using spirometry, you can pick up some uh, uh, subjects with a significant bronchodilator response. But if you use uh, oscillometry, you can actually pick up many, many more. And their conclusion, this is quoted directly from the paper, is that using oscillometry can poor asthma control and the reactance parameters are much more sensitive and this is an, a good complement to spirometry in the clinical management of asthma. And just to summarize the, the paper here in, in some text, only one subject had bronchodilation response the, the, based on FVC alone. Um, oscillometry uh, identified uh, almost twice as many uh, as uh, spirometry, only two subjects were identified by spirometry and not oscillometry. So um, that gives you the, the idea how, how much better this was. Um, and it's very clear that oscillometry can identify poor asthma control. Um, so again, um, using this in a clinical trial is of course elegant because if you Try your new um, your new candidate in a clinical trial, and you think, well, baseline shifted, but did it shift enough? Well, test with the bronchodilator to see if you can still improve. That might be a good idea. And I know that the drug companies are doing this now. Um, I have to say, talking in India as I do today is sort of preaching to the the, the choir because. In India, I've noticed that the uptake of using bronchodilator testing is, is really, really good. And um, a lot of you guys have been in touch with me or others in, in uh, um, like Dr. Reis Vonacker and so on. And, and uh, we always see that people use bronchodilator testing and it's very informative. So this all adds a nice piece to the puzzle, understanding what's going on. Um, so... Now going into more of, of bronchodilator responses. Here is an interesting case that I got from a friend back in Sweden, my old alma mater, by the way. Now this is an old lady, she's 82 years old, she has Sjogren's syndrome, scoliosis. So there's a lot of comorbidities here adding to her old age. Um, the, 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 um, uh, the, her, her, her MD, her, her, P, her GP, was worried that she had some asthma components or whatever that she might, you know, not only suffer from the the these these things that were well known. So <laughs> she was admitted here to to the the clinical of of um, of, uh, um, uh, of, of physiology, and they they ran her through the standard you know battery of tests. As you can see here, pre bronchodilator. She's she's definitely low on TLC and RV and FSC is somewhat. Um, her spirometry is you know not the best. Sixty eight percent here predicted in FIB one, for example. The interesting thing is that bronchodilator did absolutely nothing. Silch, it, it it didn't change a hair. It was just the same. And and um, uh, isn't that peculiar? Now. The thing they do at this hospital is that they have oscillometry and have used it for like 20 years. And they almost always do oscillometry, spirometry. In this case, they did that. And uh, this is uh, with the iOS device. Uh, so the, the layout of, of the, the graphs are somewhat different from what we usually see. But nonetheless, if you're up in the gray zone here or down in gray zone here, you can see the the ideal line for uh, reference data is the thin gray line here. So this indicates that this lady, she was definitely 
outside of the range of her normal. Um, maybe not that much, but definitely not fully, fully healthy. And now they gave her the bronchodilator. Look here, resistance totally normalized. Reactants also fully normalized. And she is obviously very um, re uh, reversible. So, so this is not a fixed obstruction she's suffering from. Um, why this is, why it was not detected on spirometer, we can speculate. However, I would say with her age, I don't know anything about her mental status or anything, um, but even if she's fully aware of things, it might still be very difficult for somebody who is old with also some comorbidities to do a full um, full high quality spirometry test. So this actually suggests that this is a reversible thing and maybe she could be treated for it. Unfortunately, I don't have any follow-up on this lady, but fingers crossed she was receiving proper treatment. Now, the other thing I mentioned was that we can do a hyper responsiveness test. And there are a number of ways of doing this. It's very time consuming. It has to be done by uh, personnel that is trained in doing it proper. Patients just hate it because it's very, very exhausting. Here's another example, again, from the same clinic in Sweden. Uh, again, a young woman, a non-smoker. She was previously healthy, but now she had cold symptoms. And um, over two, three months after going through some sort of, of cold, no known allergy, her exercise are normal. If we, if everyone is less than 70% predicted, she has short stature um, and she was born prematurely. So there's that in, in her history. But she was not reversible on spirometry, which you can see at the green line here is the, what should have been the reversibility, but she's not. They didn't test reversibility on um, oscillometry at least i don't have access to that data however they did and this is something we're going to come to in a moment here they did um hyper responsiveness test with methacholine so what you can see here is the the response here in percent uh, change from baseline and here we have methacholine accumulated dose on the x-axis and we can follow the um, oscillometry here uh, follow the red line here and you can see that it crosses right around here this is the 50% the increase. This is what is traditionally used as the cutoff for oscillometry. You can see that in um, spirometry down here, the crossing of the standard is right around here. So, uh, and here, just for reference, is a normal, uh, normal value from, from normal people. So it appears to me that maybe... Um, Oscillometry is more sensitive than spirometry. And wouldn't this be beautiful if we could do this with fewer doses, not having to do these forced exhalations and all the maneuvers, and maybe get this done relatively quickly and easy? Um, I think that would be a beautiful thing if that would be possible. So let's see what the future brings us here. <clears throat> Here's another case. This is a 14-year-old girl, uh, again, with uh, allergy history. <clears throat> to pollen and furry animals. She had low volumes and spirometry, but again, no reversibility. As we can see here, the green line doesn't, didn't budge. Um, again, what they do, they put her through the hyper responsiveness test. And again, we can see here that uh, 150, I didn't put in the, the, the line here, but it's crossing somewhere around here. Again, this appears to be at the lower dose than, um, than spirometry. So she was clearly um, hyper-responsive, again, indicating aller allergic asthma. So this is what I would like to come to with all this. And so this is according to me. Well, I'm allowed to speculate because that's what's invited to do here. So the patient comes in with a complaint, which at face value might sound like, all right, it sounds like an obstructive disease. What would we do? Well, so one thing, one workflow thing one could have is this. You do baseline spirometry, oscillometry, sorry. If it's uh, abnormal, well, then you do a reversibility test. If the reversibility is there, well, that increases the likelihood for putting asthma high on the differential diagnosis. If the reversibility is negative, i.e. no reversibility, well, 
then you do what they did in Malmo. You do an error hyper responsiveness test. If that comes out positive, well, that again puts you in the ballpark of asthma. If that is negative, well, that puts you in the ballpark of CPD or some other cause of obstruction. Um, if the baseline oscillometry is, is normal, well, then the patient have all the complaints and the history speaks for, you know, obstructiveness. Well, do an AHR test. And if it's positive, again, you end up in the, in the asthma corner. If the patient is not hyper-responsive, yet there are complaints that would commensurate with um, a, a true lung disease. Well, it's something other, and that requires then further investigation. Um, so this is one idea I had of how we could approach and use these things to our advantage to speed up the, the diagnosis. Um, this I just want to share this. This is uh, something I did together with my friend uh, Hamacher in Switzerland in, in Bern. Um, he has a big clinic there and he sees a lot of asthmatics and COPD patients and other things too, by the way. We just extracted from, you know, some of his, his records, a, a number of asthma patients and a number of CBD patients. They're all regular patients coming into the clinic have a follow-up. So it's, it's not a clinical study that is well controlled really. So it's really a, an excerpt of what you can find in his clinic. Uh, they all had clear diagnosis of asthma or clear diagnosis of CPD. That's the only thing we went for. He also has the routine of doing bronchodilator testing. And you can see the asthmatics, they dilated here. They re resistance went down uh, for, for R5, not so much for R20. Um, AX also decreased. Look at the CPDs. Nothing happens. Almost nothing happens. So, um, this sort of gives fuel to my, my hypothesis that one can use reversibility testing as one, one tool in order to separate out these. Um, now, I'm just a couple of slides away from my end here. And so I'll just point to the, um, um, the clinical studies that can be done with high uh, quality. So this is an example from uh, that was published a couple of years ago, where uh, they used a extra fine formulation of uh, of uh, BDP and uh, fluticasone inhaler on asthma, and it's shown that R520 diminished by a lot, X5 uh, um, uh, changed positively, and AX as well, and this was commensurate with a pheno uh, change as well after one month of treatment. Um, and it's all depicted in this nice graph here. Um, I think this is the cool one that I picked up at ERS this year, where they had this uh, combined uh, TSLP, which is a, um, a signaling um, alarming molecule uh, related to type 2 uh, asthma, and IL-13, again, the same thing. They had a small study, 36 subjects, rapid improvement with single dose, it lasted for 57 days, and they concluded uh, oscillometry resistance at heterogeneity and reactance area, the stiffness of lung, um, was consistent with improvement in small airway dysfunction. And of course, it wouldn't be me sitting at a room there if I didn't take a photo of the presentation. So we can look here at the dotted line here. This is the improvement R5 minus 20. So heterogeneity went down significantly and stayed down for 57 days. And here we can look at the, the, the elastins, same thing, a good improvement. All right, the last thing I would like to highlight, how good are we at interpreting data? Could artificial intelligence do it better? Do we need anything beyond oscillometry in the future? Well, so this is again from ERS, and this was shared to me by Dr. TC in, uh, from Toronto. They had a, a machine learning algorithm. They fed in, uh, um, uh, the, the, the algorithm with a lot of reference data uh, taught the machine to identify normal restrictive, obstructive, and a mixed uh, uh, obstructive restrictive uh, disease. And all this was done by, by standard um, uh, ATS ERS guidelines. Then they submitted to a number of experts uh, in oscillometry to look at oscillometry data only. 
And then I was actually one of the 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 experts, so say here, and and we were asked to grade the patients we saw in in these four categories. I would say we were pretty good nailing down the normals, although not perfect. Whereas AI nailed them hundred uh, percent. We failed pretty miserably in separating restriction, obstruction, and oh, forget about the mixed profile. We were really bad at that. Not that the AI was really good either, but the total difference between AI and the expert was still in favor of AI. And you have to remember, this is an abstract. It's a small sample. Um, you know, the first baby steps in this. I think this is actually future. We will probably have something like this coming out in the future where we have AI taking care of, uh, of a lot of uh, these, these things for us. So I think we need to move from the closest state of the art. It's actually not that we need. We will be moved from the closest state of the art. <laughs> this is nothing we can really do anything about. Uh, tech technology will come whether we like it or not. Keeping the patient out of the hospital is something that all uh, healthcare providers will love. Spirometry is probably failing patients and doctors. Um, I think monitoring is key for good care and good research. Um, and uh, this will um, end with AI taking over a lot of our job um, and help us guide us in the future. Um, and this will also help with uh, combining all of these things with home applications. And um, this will free up resources and we can spend our money on something else in the future. So thank you very much. Finally, a little plug for the book that's coming out anytime soon that uh, I was happy to contribute to. Okay, thank you, Dr. Leonard. As usual, it's always fantastic to hear to you and uh, you have told us what oscillometry can do now and a peep into the future that if you combine oscillometry with AI and other tools that are coming up, it would be really basically a wonderful tool to assess uh, the obstructive disease and then also ILDs in also future. So thank you for the talk. Thank you for illicit talk, which was illustrative. You also explained with the cases and that really drew down uh, the objective of the of your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leonard. And it is also Thanks a so pleasant opportunity to introduce my friend, Dr. Salil Bendre, who's, who's actually a dynamic person. He's academically very good. And also, he's an entertainer. Uh, most of you who have seen him closely uh, must have seen him as basically a magician, uh, I think a very good singer. I've seen him also a lot of mimicry. So academically and non-academically, he's he's just shining on the horizon. And I had a opportunity to take the exams with him in some of the couple of MD examination. And I I really loved it, in fact. And I was looking forward to other opportunities, Salil. So Salil basically <laughs> is a dynamic but a pulmonologist of uh, of Mathur region, actually Mumbai, and he is ex professor and head of uh, head of pulmonary medicine in this KG Soma Medical College. So I think Salil, you are the boss today to to that moderate uh, this this house webinar, and over to you. Thank you, uh, thank move, you. Move on. Thank you, thank you. That, was, <laughs> <laughs> that made the mood a little lighter. But thank you for that <laughs> introduction. So uh, uh, after that. Wonderful talk of Dr. Leonard. We will proceed to Dr. Sandeep Salvi. Uh, I actually don't need to introduce him because everyone, all the pulmonologists from India as well as abroad know him very well. But just to make matters more specific and more easy, he is of course going to be telling us the tricks and the trade or how to manage and few of the you know pointers for understanding oscillometry. Uh, he is the president of Indian Chess Society, member of the board of directors, gold member, scientific committee, Gina, chair of the chronic respiratory disease section, global burden disease, India, a member of the steering committee on air, air pollution, health, the Ministry of Health and Welfare, government of India, published so many papers, peer reviewed journals and the best and I would say the most uh, prestigious for all our countrymen, ranked number one respiratory scientist in India by the Stanford University ranking 2023. The previous year and number 52 in the world out of 60,472 global respiratory scientists. So he's the director presently of the Pulmocare Research Education that is the Pure Foundation in Pune 
and he is doing really wonderful work and helping us understand uh, about not only oscillometry but respiratory physiology. His lectures are always a super hit. When he comes and gives talks, we are all eager to learn from him. So with that, I hand over the uh, the, the 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 stage to Dr. Sarvi sir, and please he can proceed. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Bendri, for those very kind words of welcome and introduction. It is a real pleasure to <clears throat> to be present for this uh, very fascinating webinar on oscillometry. I bring to you greetings from the Indian Chess Society as the president, and I hope that you have been enjoying. Uh, the webinar series that we have been conducting on obstructive airway diseases. I will be talking about uh, the secrets of interpreting oscillometry, which I hope uh, you will benefit immensely in your clinical practice. So let us start straight away. We are all well versed with spirometry and the spirometry report gives you these two graphs, the flow volume loop and the volume time graph and the four parameters uh, the two volumes, the two flows, and the ratio between the two volumes. The way we interpret uh, spirometry is based on the percentage predicted values or the low limit of normal, and more recently, the Z scores have been used. And the reason why we need to use the percentage predicted is the spirometry values, they change significantly with age. And here you can see on the x-axis is the age in years. When you're born, you have about a liter of uh, air in your lungs. As you grow old, up to the age of 20, there's a sharp and a sudden increase in your lung growth, reaches a peak at around 20, and then there's a slow and steady decline. So age has a huge impact on these spirometry indices. You can also see the differences in the ethnicity. The line on the top are those, born, are those who are born in uh, US or UK, and the line at the bottom are those who are born in Asia, like India. So the place where you are born decides how tall you're going to reach on your spirometry. The height also makes a significant impact on your spirometry predicted values because as you, as you grow tall, your thorax volume increases and therefore your lung volumes also increase significantly. And in fact, these five parameters, they contribute to 70 to 90% of the variability and therefore it is imperative whenever you're, whenever you're interpreting spirometry to have this data very properly fed, which will give you a predicted value or a reference value. And then using the reference value, you use the percentage predicted or the Z scores to make an interpretation. Now with this background, do we need to do the same in oscillometry? The answer very strangely and very interestingly is no. So if you look at the resistance values, which is on the top, as you're, when you're born, your resistance values are high. And this is, I mean, R5 value at 5 hertz. So where you got high resistance values at uh, when you're born. As you grow older, the resistance values, they drop down until you reach the age of 15. And after the age of 15, it's almost a straight line. So age has no impact on the resistance values uh, after adulthood. In children, yes. There is the, you need to either have this predicted equation or you need to have cutoff values for individual age groups. The same thing also is seen in reactance values. So this is X5. You can see that the reactance is very negative when you're born, becomes less negative as you grow old, reaches a, uh, reaches a top at around 15 years and it's a straight line after that. So during adulthood, you do not need actually predicted values to make an interpretation, you just need cutoff values. And I'm going to talk a little more about it in the subsequent slides. This is a very important paper that was published in December 2023 that derived the so-called predicted equation for resistance and reactance over here. So there are resistance and the reactant lines are here. The red line are females and the blue line are males. <clears throat> and very interestingly, they derived the so-called reference values from the age of 2.7 to 90 years. There, I don't think any other study has, uh, has you know, derived the predicted or the reference values at such a big age range. Now, what you see is exactly what I showed you in the previous slide. When you're born, you have very high resistance. It drops down until the age of around 17, 18. There is absolutely no difference between boys and girls. It's almost overlapped. 
And then after adulthood, after you reach adulthood, the more or less a straight line. But there is a gap between the males and the females. The females have a higher resistance value. The males have a lower resistance value. But you know what? Very interestingly, this gap uh, is not because of gender differences. This gap is because females are shorter in height than males. So when you actually do the calculations for the difference between males and females from the age of 20 to the age of 19, the difference is only because of height. So gender has absolutely no impact on the uh, resistance values. The same thing you see in the reactance values. The apparent, uh, the apparent difference that you see between females in the red and the males in blue is only attributed to height. So we very recently wrote a letter to the, uh, to the journal, the European Respiratory Journal Open Research, uh, arguing for the fact that the only variable for oscillometry seems to be height. Gender is not important. In the adulthood, age is not important. So it's very fascinating that, you know, tomorrow when you want to do oscillometry in a patient, the only parameter that you need to record is height. And the height is going to give you what should be the cutoff value. So this paper, this letter to the editor has just been accepted yesterday. And I think it's a very important uh, concept that oscillometry is dependent only on height, no gender, no age. <clears throat> Using the Antlia device, which is an FOT that has been developed in India, we actually derived the so-called cutoff values. As I said, we don't need predicted values. We need only cutoff values. Just like how you need cutoff values for your blood pressure, for your blood sugar, for, for your blood cholesterol, you don't need a predicted equation, unlike spirometry. So the cutoff values that we derived for the FOT for the Indian population is mentioned over here. The unit is in centimeters water per liter per second. So the upper limit, let's call this as the upper limit of normal. For R5, it is 4 centimeters. For R20, it is 3 centimeters. R5 minus R20 should be less than 1 centimeter. X5 is minus 1. AX, which is the area of reactance, is 4 centimeters. And the resonant frequency is 12, 12 hertz. So these are the cutoff values. But I must state that this is only for the adults because for the children, uh, you need to have cutoff values at different ages or you need to calculate the height and then find out what should be the uh, the predicted value. So this is very fascinating because, you know, it makes oscillometry a very simple test to perform. Only height is the variable that you need to measure. Now, the problem with oscillometry is that if you take different oscillometry devices, they will give you different values. And here is a study that was published about three, four, three, four years ago. The, the every each line over here represents a different oscillometry device. So they don't give you the same values at low test load. So low test load means uh, which simulates healthy individuals. There is some difference that you get between the devices. This is for R5, resistance at 5 hertz. For reactants at 5 hertz, you can see that there is a much bigger difference, even in a normal healthy or a normal test load. So if you measure the X5 with this device, you should get this value. If you measure the X5 with this device, you will get this value. And look at the, there's a big difference between the two. When you increase the test load to simulate obstructive airway diseases, then the resistance differences between the devices become quite significant. And the same thing you see for reactants. Now, what does this mean for us in clinical practice? That you different devices will give you different cutoff values. And therefore, if you have to make an interpretation, you have to derive the cutoff values for each device separately. If you do a test one day on this device and you do the test on the other day in another device, you cannot compare that because they give you different values. Up and until these all these devices get harmonized so that all of them actually give you the same value uh, <clears throat> until that point of time, we will have to live with these differences between the devices. Now for children, as I said, the uh, when you're when you're three years old, the resistance is very high. It reduces as you grow old. So these are these sort of values that I have obtained from a from a publication. Three years, it's fourteen. Five years, it's uh, ten. Uh, ten years, it's seven. And for fifteen years, it's four. And then after four, as uh, with the, in the adult population, it remains a flat line. The same thing happens with reactants in children. So in a three-year-old child, the normal X5 value is minus five. In a five-year-old, it's minus three. Ten-year-old, it's minus two. 
15 year old is minus one and then it's a flat line after that. Resonant frequency in children is very high, up to 30 hertz. When as you age, the resonant frequency drops down and in the adulthood, it's about eight to 12. So the only, the only point I wanted to make was in children, you need to have cutoff values for different ages or for different heights. But for adults, uh, it is one single parameter. The oscillogram, uh, <clears throat> like the spirogram, is this simple uh, two-line graph that you get. On the y-axis is the uh, units for resistance, uh, either be resistance or reactance. On the x-axis is the frequency that uh, at which the values have been measured. So you always start with the lowest frequency, which is 5 hertz. You go up to 20 hertz, and most of the other devices, they give you values up to 35. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to use only 5 to 20 for the sake of helping you to understand how to interpret. Now, these two lines, the blue line is the line of resistance. So at some point of time, you know, you can see that the resistance at 5 hertz is this much. And as you increase the frequency, the resistance line remains a flat line. Even your resistance at 20 hertz is the same as the resistance at 5 hertz. So in other words, resistance is frequency independent. No matter what frequency we use, the resistance line, the line of resistance remains a flat line, a straight line. In contrast to that, look at the line of reactance. So the reactance line, it starts from a negative point. So if this is point zero, it starts from a negative point at, at five hertz. So X5 is a negative value. As you increase the frequency, the, the reactance becomes less and less negative. It reaches a point of zero uh, where the reactance is zero, and this point is called as the resonant frequency. And after the resonant frequency, it becomes a positive number. So very interesting. The, the portion of the reactance before the resistance, before the, before the uh, re resonant frequency is your elastance, and after the resonant frequency is your inertance. The triangular portion that we get from 5 hertz to the resonant frequency, this triangular portion, is called as area of reactance or AX. So these are the parameters that you need to understand in oscillometry. For spirometry, we have FEV1, FVC, peak flow, and the FEF 25 to 75. In oscillometry, we have R5, we have R20. The difference between the R5 and the R20, then you have X5, you have resonant frequency, and then you have the area of reactance. As simple as that. So here are these parameters. The R5 or the resistance at 5 hertz, which is this point, here, this point here, it tells you the total respiratory resistance. The R20, this point, gives you information about resistance in the large airways. And R5 minus R20 gives you resistance in the small airways. So your resistance values tell you about the three different components. So total airway resistance, resistance in the large airways, resistance in the small airways using these three different resistance parameters. Then you have the resonant frequency where the reactance is zero. Then you have the X5, which is the reactance at five hertz, which is a negative number. And then this area of uh, reactance, which is a triangular portion. In addition to that, there are two more parameters which I would uh, like you to use in your interpretation. X5 during inspiration and X5 during expiration. And I'll show you how useful these are in evaluating uh, patients for their interpretation. X5 inspiratory minus X5 expiratory is called as delta X5. So let's talk about it later. <clears throat> so here is, let's, here is a starter. Here is a graph that I have draw, drawn. I have shown you the resistance values over here, the reactance values over here. The unit is in centimeters, water per liter per second. Here is a frequency on the X axis. So what are the values for R5? So R5 is this point, which is, Three, three centimeters water per liter per second. Which one is R20? This point is R20. And that is also three centimeters water per liter per second. R5 minus R20 is three minus three, which is almost zero. So R5 minus R20 is zero. X5 is this point over here, which is minus one. So this is minus one centimeters water per liter per second. And your resonant frequency is at eight hertz. So your resonant frequency is at eight hertz. And this is the triangular portion, which are called as area of reactance. This is the fundamental knowledge that you need to have 
when you want to interpret oscillometry. Now, what do these parameters actually tell you? So I told you about R5, R20, R5 minus R20. I will not repeat it now. X5 gives you three different pieces of information. Small airways obstruction is seen in X5. X5 also represents lung elastins and compliance and lung heterogeneity as Dr. Lennart mentioned in his presentation. So X5 gives you everything that is happening in the distal portion of the lung, be it the small airways or be it the lung parenchyma. So X5 is giving you that piece of information. Area of reactance is a composite <clears throat> of uh, what is happening again in the distal portion of the lung, both the small airways as well as the lung parenchyma. So X5 and AX are about the distal portion of the lung. AX is a composite, X5 is a single number. Resonant frequency will uh, get impaired during airflow obstruction, but also during lung restriction. And how do you differentiate between the two? I'll mention it in my subsequent slides. Now, this is interesting because I'm going to show you some data over here. X5 inspiratory and X5 expiratory. Now, remember that in patients with obstructive airway disease, they have a difficulty in breathing out. So their X5, uh, X, the, the, the reactance at 5 hertz during expiration is more than during inspiration. And this is classically seen in obstructive airway disease. Exactly the opposite happens in restrictive lung disease, where they have difficulty in breathing in. And therefore, the X5 inspiration is more negative than the X5 expiration. So now you can use your X5 inspiration and X5 expiratory values to understand whether there is airway disease or whether there is restrictive lung disease. So that's the beauty of this parameter. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of this. Now, I did mention about R5 minus R20 as representing small airways, but there is a change that is happening where R5 minus R19 is going to be considered instead of R5 minus R20. And the answer is, why are we using R5 minus R20 and not R5 minus R20? Is because of harmonic dis distortions. 5 hertz is going to affect 10, 15, 20 because of the harmonics. And therefore, whatever is happening at 5 hertz will get impacted in the 20 hertz also. And therefore, you there, there'll be distortions at the 20 hertz and you'll get wrong values. So you use numbers such as prime numbers which cannot be divided. There'll be no harmonics. So R5 is a prime number. 19 is a prime number and therefore you will get more cleaner signal about the small airways if you use R5 minus R20, R19. Now, although this is the correct parameter to be uh, used for interpretation, for the sake of simplicity, I will use R5 minus R20 for my subsequent slides. Now, here is a classical graph that you get in asthma. This blue dotted line is the line of a normal healthy individual. And this green dotted line is the line of reactance of a normal healthy individual. Now, I told you that in a normal healthy individual, the upper limit of normal for R5 is 4, 4 centimeters water per liter per second. For R20 is 3, and therefore R5 minus R20 should be less than 1. Now, see what has happened in a patient with asthma. The R5 value compared to that of a normal healthy individual has increased. So, this is pre-bronchodilator increase in R5. What has happened to the R20 value compared to that of a normal healthy individual? R20 is also increased. And the R5 minus R20, which is the gap between this point and this point, this point is also increased. So in asthma, you will find increase in R5, you will find increase in R20, and you will find increase in R5 minus R20. After giving a bronchodilator, the R5 value reduces, doesn't come back to normal, it may come back to normal. <clears throat> the R20 value comes back to normal after, after giving a bronchodilator. So this is the bronchodilator response that you get in the resistance values in an asthma patient. Now this green dotted line, as I said, is the resonant frequency, so is the line of reactance. This point is the resonant frequency. So see what has happened to the X5 value in an asthmatic patient. Compared to a normal healthy individual, it has become more negative. The resonant frequency in the normal healthy individual is this. This is the resonant frequency in an asthmatic. So you can see that the resonant frequency has shifted to the right. There is a more negative X5 value. The resonant frequency is shifted to the right. And therefore, this triangular portion, which is AX, becomes big in size. After giving a bronchodilator, you can see that the X5 value becomes less negative. From here, pre-bronchodilator to post-bronchodilator, which is here. 
the resonant frequency shifts from here to the left. So there is a shift in the left after a bronchodilator in resonant frequency. And this triangular portion after a bronchodilator becomes smaller than the pre-bronchodilator value. So this is what you classically get in a patient with asthma. Now see what you get in a patient with COPD. Again, line of resistance in a normal healthy individual. R5 is significantly increased. It increases a lot more than what you find in asthma. R20 value is relatively normal in a patient of COPD because 20 represents large airways. And COPD is a disease that primarily affects only the small airways. So you'll only see an impact on the small airways, which is R5 and the R5 minus R20, significantly bigger over here. R20 is normal, which is large airways. After giving a bronchodilator, you can see some slight bronchodilator response in R5, but no change in R20. Similarly, if you look at the X5 value in a patient of COPD, it becomes very, very negative, more negative. The resonant frequency shifts to the right <clears throat> and the area of reactance becomes much bigger. If you give a bronchodilator to a patient of COPD, the X5 value becomes less negative. The resonant frequency shifts to the left and the area of reactance, this triangle becomes smaller. So if you have to evaluate some element of bronchodilator responsiveness in a patient of COPD, reactance parameters will show you a better response than the resistance parameters in patients with COPD. Okay, now small airways obstruction is a very important uh, parameter that you get in, uh, in, in oscillometry. What is small airways obstruction? Increase in R5. So this is a normal healthy individual. Line of resistance, which is a straight line. Line of reactance. This is X5, this is the resonant frequency, and this is the area of reactance, which is a small triangle. This is what you get in a patient with small airways obstruction. R5 value goes high, R20 value is normal. R5 minus R20 becomes a big difference. X5 becomes more negative. Resonant frequency shifts to the right, and the area of reactance becomes big. So these are all the parameters that you get in patients with small airways obstruction. <coughs> Now, there are some devices that give you values for resistance and reactance, either in centimeters water per liter per second or in kilopascals per liter per second. If you're using an impulse oscillometer, it gives you values in kilopascals per liter per second. If you're using the Trimoflow or if you're using the Indian Antlia device, it will give you values in centimeters water per liter per second. Here is a simple formula for conversion from centimeters water to kilopascals. Okay, as simple as that. Now, just to show you resistance on this portion and the top portion, reactant starts from the negative value, and these are the different frequencies that I have just mentioned in my earlier slides. Now, this green box tells you what should be, this is the, if your line of resist, uh, resistance is in this green box, it is normal. If your line of reactance is in this blue box, then it is normal. And here is an example. This is the line of resistance. This is the line of reactance. Okay, both of them within the colored box. Now, when you have a line that is higher than the normal, R5 is increased, R20 is also increased, and your R5 minus R20 is zero. This is classically seen in only large airways obstruction. So increase in R5, increase in R20, and R5 minus R20 is normal. This is pure large airways obstruction. Now, when you get start getting small airways obstruction, this is the shape of the curve that you get. R5 is increased, R20 is normal, and the R5 minus R20 becomes bigger. This is small airways obstruction. And as the severity of the small airways obstruction increases, such as in asthma or COPD, the lines go higher and higher. And your R5 minus R20, that gap becomes bigger and bigger <clears throat> as your severity increases. This is the line of reactance, normal. So resonant frequency is 10. It should be between 8 to 12. And as these small airways obstruction happens, the line of reactance becomes more negative. I can see X5 has become more negative. Resonant frequency shifts to the right and the area of, the area of reactance becomes big. And as the severity increases, the X5 becomes more negative. Resonant frequency shifts to the right and the area of reactance becomes bigger. So this is classically what you find in patients with obstructive airway disease. Now, just to give you some uh, examples, R5 is 6 centimeters water per liter per second. R20 is 5. R5 minus R20 is 1. For the sake of your simplicity, I've just put the cutoff values over here. And I've expressed that as percentage change from the cutoff values. So you can see R5 is increased. R20 is also increased. 
R5 minus R20 is this is normal. Is there obstruction? And where is it? The obstruction is purely in the large airways. Another example. R5 is increased, R20 is normal, and R5 minus R20 is increased. So normal R20, increase in R5, increase in R5 minus R20. Where is the obstruction? Purely in the small airways. Another example, R5 is increased, R20 is increased, R5 minus R20 is also increased. Everything is increased. Where is the obstruction? The obstruction is both in the large and small airways. So by looking at the R5, R20 and the R5 minus R20, you can categorize your patients into pure large airways obstruction, pure small airways obstruction or mixed large and small airways obstruction. Okay, simple. Uh, <clears throat> Bronchodilator responsiveness. Dr. Lennart highlighted about the importance of looking for bronchodilator responses in uh, patients with asthma or COPD after giving them a bronchodilator. How much bronchodilator response should happen in an oscillometry test? And I think the best study for this is a one that was just published early this year in 2024. This is a study from uh, Sweden. Uh, perhaps one of the best studies that I have seen. 23 mild to moderate patients who have good bronchodilator responsiveness. They, they, they looked at bronchodilator responsiveness with three drugs, Saba alone, Sama alone, Saba plus Saba, Saba plus Sama. So the Saba was 400 micrograms and the Sama was 80 micrograms of ipratropium. And the tool that they used was impulse oscillometry system. And I thought this is absolutely a brilliant study. So let's see what they found. Now, x-axis is the time. So they did they did the they did, did the spirometry here is FEV1 at multiple time points and y axis is the responsiveness of FEV1 in percentage change. So after giving a bronchodilator, focus on this green line over here. So within 10 minutes of 20 minutes, it reaches a peak and then it remains a flat line for about an hour. So the what is the bronchodilator responsiveness we got with FEV1? It's just a little over 10%, so I've called it as 12%. And this is exactly the cutoff value that we use. When you look at FEF 25 to 75, the cutoff value that has been reported in the literature is 25%. And here is what they found. So in 10 minutes, it reaches almost the, the peak. For 20 minutes, it reaches the peak. And then it's a straight, straight line. And the responsiveness is just a little about 20. So this, this cutoff is also correct. Now that they got the correct responsiveness with FEV1 and FEF 25 to 75, what is the equivalent change that they found in the oscillometry indices? So here is the value for R5. You can see that the R5 value increases, peak, reaches a peak by around 10 minutes earlier than the FEV1, and then remains a flat line. And what is the sort of change that they get is around 20%. So I would say that a 20% change in R5 over the baseline is indicative of good bronchodilator responsiveness. For R20, you can see that you're just below A20, so I've called it as 18%. When they look at uh, R5 minus R20, you can see the haphazard lines, but look at the green line over here. The units over here, percentage change is about, so this is 50%, but I can see just a little below 50%. Interestingly, the maximum R5 minus R20 bronchodilator value you get is at 60 minutes. Unlike FEV1, unlike R5, you get it in five, you get it at 10 minutes. Here you get it at 60 minutes. And the percentage change that you get is around 25 to 40%. I think that should be the equivalent for R5 minus R20. For X5, you can see the percentage change, it's around 25%. So if there's a 25% change in X5, we would say that it is good bronchodilator responsiveness. For resonant frequency, you can say that it's 20%. And for area of reactance, it's around 40%. So I, I would suggest that you should use these cutoff values for good bronchodilator responsiveness in your clinic. Now, this is the only one study which I think is one of the one of the best studies that I've seen. So I'm going to call this as working cutoffs for good bronchodilator reversibility. And I've mentioned the same values that I just showed you earlier. Uh, <clears throat> until there are more studies from different parts of the world that sort of validate this, we should continue to use these cutoff values to say good bronchodilator responsiveness on oscillometry. Now, very, very, very quickly, examples of a three-year-old boy who suffered with asthma had three hospitalizations for probably as asthma in the last one year. 
the parents were refusing to accept the diagnosis of asthma because they they went and met Dr. Google and the Google told them that the child may not necessarily have asthma. So they did doctor shopping until they came to our place. Now, this is a report for resistance and reactance. You can see here, this is kilopascals per liter per second. So this is a test that we did on the impulse oscillometry. Blue is pre-bronchodilator, red is post-bronchodilator. I have converted the kilopascals into centimeters water by multiplying it by 10.197. Now look at the shape of these curves, pre-bronchodilator, post-bronchodilator. This is reactance, pre-bronchodilator. So you can see the resonant frequency is almost 35 over here. The X5 is 0.8, I mean, so this is 8 point, uh, sorry, minus 8.15. And look at the bronchodilator response. So the resonant frequency has shifted, the area of reactance has become smaller. Here are the numbers. So if you want to believe in the numbers, here are the numbers. <clears throat> I think anybody who sees this will say that this is a classical case of asthma in a three-year-old child. Can you, can you imagine doing a spirometry in a three-year-old child? It's not easy at all. In this child, we did oscillometry and the parents, they, we showed them the graph. We showed them the values and the parents were, were then convinced that the child has asthma. The child started being put on inhaled corticosteroids and the child is now perfectly fine. But look at, look at the value of oscillometry in diagnosing pediatric asthma. This is an adult individual, 48-year-old female professional singer, cough with nighttime awakenings, spirometry, pre-bronchodilator, post-bronchodilator. This is the flow volume loop, volume time graph. You can see that the bronchodilator responsiveness is not much, only 7% and 120 ml. Cutoff value is 12% and 200 ml. But look at the changes that we got on oscillometry. Pre-bronchodilator, post-bronchodilator, pre-bronchodilator for reactants and pre-post-bronchodilator for reactants. So here are the values. So what should be the normal R5 for a healthy adult? Should be 4, isn't it? This is 9.6, so it's significantly increased. Reduced to 5.9 after giving a bronchodilator. This is surely more than 20% wrong. R20 is also reduced. R5 minus R20, look at this. 3.2, upper limit of normal is 1. So this is a three-fold increase in the small airways. So this is small airway dysfunction-related asthma. After giving a bronchodilator, it reduced by almost 50%. Fits into the bronchodilator responsiveness. Look at X5, minus 3. Cutoff value is minus 1. So three-fold increase in X5. Reduced to almost 50%. Area of reactants, which should have been 4, is now 41. And after giving a bronchodilator, reduces. The resonant frequency is reduced from 30 to 20. Classical case of bronchial asthma, predominantly small airways dysfunction. So spirometry did not pick it up, but oscillometry did. Now, these are two very interesting examples. And this is done on, a, uh, on, on, on another. Uh, this is the trimoflow device. Resistance on the top, reactants at the bottom pre-bronchodilator, post-bronchodilator, pre-bronchodilator, post-bronchodilator. Here are the values. So I put the cutoff values over here. So R5 is increased, R20 is increased, R5 minus R20 is increased, X5 is five-fold gone down. Uh, area of reactance is huge. Resonant frequency is shifted to the right. What is the diagnosis? R5 is increased, R20 is increased. R5 minus R20 is almost four-fold increase. So R20 is not as much increased as R5 and R5 R5 minus R20. So this is classically, this seems to be obstructive airway disease, COPD type, because there is poor bronchodilator responsiveness, as you can see here. Another case over here, resistance is, uh, you can see the resistance is around five, which is increased. After giving a bronchodilator, there's no change. R5 minus R20, there seems to be a sum increase over here. But no, but you can see it's almost normal over here. Reactance lines, well, slightly reduced, no change after a bronchodilator, but your resonant frequency is increased to 25. Almost you can see 24 over here. So what is the diagnosis in this case? <clears throat> now here the X5 inspiratory and X5 expiratory is going to give you the clue. X5 inspiratory is minus 4.8, X5 expiratory is minus 6.5. X5 expiratory is more negative than X5 inspiratory. So this is obstructive airway disease, COPD. Now look at this one. X5 inspiratory is minus 3.3. X5 expiratory is minus 1.28. So the X5 inspiratory is more negative than the X5 expiratory. What is this? So what does this tell you? Restrictive lung disease. So this is COPD and this is interstitial lung disease. Classical cases that I've showed you over here. Now can you tell me what, what is this? So R5 is increased. 
poor bronchodilator response r20 seems to be almost normal close to normal and there is an increase in r5 minus r20 x5 has gone significantly down uh, resonant frequency is shifted to more than 35 and look at the area of reactance my god that's huge and after giving a bronchodilator there is absolutely no change so what is your diagnosis let me show you a chest x-ray for that so post tb lung disease this is classical copd in a patient with post-TB lung fibrosis. Classical, I think you couldn't get a better oscillometry value than this. Interstitial lung disease is a very important new clinical application for oscillometry. And uh, I just showed you one, one uh, figure earlier. So this is a normal healthy individual resistance, normal healthy individual reactance, and this is the area of reactance. In a patient with interstitial lung disease, resistance does not change much compared to a healthy individual. The X5 becomes a little more negative. Resonant frequency shifts to the right. Area of reactance becomes big because there is pulmonary fibrosis. So the elastance goes off. Becomes a very, uh, the, the elastance, the, the lung becomes very elastic, rigid. And therefore you see that change in the small airway component over here. Now there is something called intra-breath oscillometry, which will tell you end expiratory uh, reactance, end inspiratory reactance. And you can see th that end expiratory is less negative, end inspiratory is more negative. And this shape of the graph, you know, expiratory going more down compared to the, uh, sorry, inspiratory going more down compared to expiratory, classically seen in interstitial lung disease. So I believe you can diagnose interstitial lung disease early by looking at the reactance parameters. Look at reactance during inspiration, look at reactance during expiration. And I believe that follow-up of these patients, if you started them on an antifibrotic drug, I think X5 is going to be a very good parameter to tell you whether the patient is getting better or not. Last couple of slides, and just to highlight some of the importance of oscillometry in lung transplant, the message that I wanted to convey is lung transplant patients have a risk of developing lung rejection, and oscillometry can pick that up three days in advance compared to even what other tools such as pyrometry does. So this is a very old study that was published in 2010. And there's some recent studies have shown that lung transplant rejection could be bronchiolitis obliterans, could be restrictive allograft syndrome. This is obstructive, this is restrictive. And oscillometry can actually give you that distinction. This is a, this is a rejection which is obstructive and this is a rejection which is restrictive and so simple to perform in these patients. So what are the distinct advantages of lung oscillometry? Easy to perform, needs normal tidal breathing, not not like spirometry, does not need predicted values. Height seems to be the only parameter that determines the values of oscillometry indices. Cutoff values to help differentiate between normal and abnormal and provides additional information about lungs than what spirometry does. So it tells you about elastins, capacitance, which spirometry does not. Spirometry gives you lung volumes, gives you lung flows. It doesn't give you the elastins properties of the lung. What do I see as the future of oscillometry? And I think these are very exciting times. Oscillometry will be immensely beneficial in the diagnosis of sad asthma. You know, 50% of the asthmatics that we see in our clinics have sad asthma, predominant small airways dysfunction. Now, diagnosing sad asthma and treating them with ultrafine inhaled corticosteroids is going to be the future of treating these patients. But how do you diagnose sad asthma? Oscillometry. Diagnosis of early COPD or pre-COPD because small airways are affected. Spirometry is not very sensitive to pick up small airways obstruction. Oscillometry is. So pre-COPD cases can be picked up on oscillometry. Diagnosis and response to treatment of interstitial lung disease. I've just shown you some slides with respect to that. Post-lung transplant management. I think oscillometry is going to be the future. And then finally, there is a tool that is in the developmental stage. It's a monofrequency oscillometry. Just like the peak flow meter, this is going to be like uh, you know, a single frequency oscillometry, 5 hertz. And uh, you, know, you can use this in the clinic for screening purposes. So very, very exciting times ahead for oscillometry. I would stop over here. And uh, I hope I've not taken too much of time. But I hope you all have, uh, you all have understood the secrets of interpreting oscillometry. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Salil Bengal. Yeah, 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 thank you, sir. Uh, it's it's really always, as I mentioned in the beginning, a pleasure to listen to your talk. You make it sound so simple, make it very easy to understand. And though it's a branch which we are seeing uh, in the recent years, but every time we learn a lot. And 
many questions were getting bombarded into the chat chat box and through the your talk almost you have been able to you know answer many of those doubts about restriction and obstruction so thankful to you for that wonderful talk i will Thank proceed you. yeah i will proceed to dr rajesh varnakar now again he is a very well known uh, pulmonologist very active in every program and every academic uh, initiative uh, he is presently the president of the south east asian academy of sleep medicine national treasurer indian chest society a director and chief pulmonary consultant at the getwell hospital and research institute again has many papers to it credit and he's been the medical director of center of excellence in clinical research which is a research consulting and site facilitating organiz organization in nagpur and of course is a member of the editorial board at of lung india so without further delay i would request dr rajesh uh, to please present his cases so that we can get a more easier understanding of this uh, test the oscillometry so dr rajesh over to you Aditi, you would be putting on the recording. Ah, uh, yes, yes. We are, uh, we are playing the recording. Just for a minute, I'm just sharing the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After the talks. Hello, everybody, and. after the talks of two stalwarts of the lenard and dr sardvi who have now set the stage uh, for further discussion on oscillometry and it is seen that everybody wants uh, to interpret oscillometry and to learn how to do it so my job today is to bring to you some very simple case illustration for actually the beginners who have started doing oscillometry to understand uh, how you can imply this oscillometry how you can do oscillometry in your daily practice so let me share my presentation and here we go so uh some cases that i have selected from my own actually daily practice and before we see the cases uh it's often that i or we get asked that how to really begin doing oscillometry in a daily practice so which are the cases that would actually benefit from doing oscillometry so very simple you can if you have got a periodic practice then very young patients the old patients the physically challenged patients and others who are not able to perform the forced expiratory maneuver that is required to get good result in spirometry these are the patients and these are about 20% of the patient established that about 20% of patients will not be able to do uh, do experimentary so these are your straight cases in which you can try and do oscillometry in those patients then you know that spirometry has got 29 contraindications uh, while there are none for doing oscillometry so in patients on whom there is this contraindication of doing it like recent cardiac events recent pneumothorax thromboembolism uh, you can do spirometry because it doesn't cause any stress uh, to any of your system and in fact it is said that anyone who can breathe can do the oscillometry another is if you have a patient and if you are having the history and suspecting that he may be having obstructing av disease uh, but you find that or despite you have done actually good spirometry it is coming normal so it is basically a worthwhile exercise uh, to do oscillometry in these patients and to see if there is an obstruction 
as per the history that you have elucidated. Because within a spirometry, if you do actually, oscillometry is much more sensitive than spirometry in, in detecting these cases. Another case that you would see subsequently is when you do a spirometry, there is obstruction, but we don't know where the obstruction is there, whether it is central obstruction or if there is a peripheral small airway disease. Uh, so, oscillometry is the tool that will also tell you where is the obstruction, whether it is central or peripheral, and this has got therapeutic outcomes, as you would see in my cases. And it's been said that oscillometry is also now actually recognized as a tool to detect early COPD. There are studies going on uh, to also have, have this fact established and, and there are papers now. And another uh, I mean indication where actually spirometry has almost gone out of use or oscillometry has taken over is to actually detect early lung transplant rejection. You know that these patients are very fragile patients have to have to be followed up and we have to do surveillance bronchoscopy uh, also periodically to see the early rejection. And here uh, we are seeing that the oscillometry uh, has come very handy. Now, when you start doing oscillometry and you've got both the tools uh, as uh, I'm doing it since last four or five years, Initially, I do oscillometry and spirometry both in all new patients. And when you do this, uh, always do oscillometry first and then the spirometry. So these are the cases uh, that would tell you this is a 90 year old uh, Amma who had refused to do the PFT every time she used to come. She used to say, no, please don't, please don't subject me to oscillometry. Uh, she had asthma. And now I'm actually monitoring her through oscillometry only and she's happy to do it. Uh, same is the case with these patients. They are young patients, as young as two year old, and uh, they are happy to do this and you don't get much time and you can do it quickly in fact. So these are the early patients that you can do. Uh, this is a patient who, who is actually physically challenged, is a patient of Russian atrophy, uh, was not able to do his daily activities through his hands and and, to, and through legs. And this patient uh, is able to do oscillometry very easily. So these are the initial patients that you can basically deploy oscillometry uh, for treating various obstructive disease or conditions. So let's begin with a very simple case. As I said, that spirometry, the uh, service uh, oscillometry is not at all very sensitive tool. So you get cases in which there is normal spirometry and abnormal oscillometry. So this is a patient who had clear history of obstructive disease, I had V's, history of V's, uh, has also nasal allergy, nasal block, all those symptoms of allergy bronchial asthma. But uh, his uh, this uh, PFT came actually normal and the spirometry came normal. But when we did the oscillometry, you could see that there is obstruction and there is some sort of reversibility is there. So this is obstructive disease which can be missed uh, by actually spirometry. And if you've got history, you can check doing oscillometry and see and again revisit the diagnosis. Another case, this is an excellent demonstration of asthma's reversibility as uh, we as know that oscillometry is more sensitive than spirometry to show reversibility or even bronchopropagation in the same dose which is used for spirometry. So this case illustrates that we do, there is obstruction, this is a case of asthma and we do the reversibility test after bronchodilatation. See actually reversibility in, in this case, when we do spirometry, and then when we do the oscillometry, see there is a robust change of betterment in AX and all those parameters R5, R5 minus 20, showing that this is a case of asthma and diversity is quite robust. And the same dose of four puffs of salbutamol, it was given to both 
in like both the cases of spirometry and oscillometry, but see the change. Uh, this is another case where this is a perfect example of how you can show the reversibility in oscillometry. So the curves would come actually closure. So this is pre bronchodilatation This is post, and it is showing the change for the better uh, in AX and R5 minus 20. And by looking at the graph itself, you can see that this is a case of reversible obstructive disease and, and of maybe a case of asthma. Uh, uh, another uh, similar case in which we see that spirometry is normal, all the values are in green, but you can see a little bit of obstruction when you pick the oscillometry. This is the same patient, and uh, we did the oscillometry first and then uh, spirometry and found that uh, sarot became normal, but oscillometry is showing uh, the obstruction and some sort of diversity, maybe partial diversity, uh, a case of some uh, obstructive disease, actually, definitely. Uh, another case uh, which illustrates the same finding, abnormal oscillometry, but normal, this is another case. You see a very mild obstruction, but see that this is a case in which there is the reactance has really been uh, gone down and this is maybe a case of obstructive disease, I think probably COPD or something because uh, re reactance is affected much more and you can see the values which are in red. Uh, this case is a very interesting illustration uh, that spirometry shows obstructive disease uh, with significant diversity which is suggestive of asthma and this case I have taken to show that in when we do spirometry, we don't know where the obstruction is, but here you can see that oscillometry clearly shows that it is actually a predominant central AV obstruction. Look at the curves. This is this is the spirometry, and this is the oscillometry, which shows that resistance is affected much more. So R20 is affected much much more. So the central. So you see the curves. This is almost parallel to the normal curve and, and after bronchodilatation, the pre post values see the only upper of resistance values have changed while the value below are not much affected. So I think this is a case of central airway obstruction. Similarly, uh, what you can see in some cases is that this is a predominant small airway obstruction where R20 is normal while R5, R5 minus 20 and X which are the parameters to know the small AV functions are affected. Now this has got also treatment implications as I had said earlier in the sense that if this patient comes to you and is not improving with I think with the normal inhalers you have checked also their adherence and also their basically how, how they do this in illness and also technique is right. So in this patient, uh, this there is a good case of employing the ultra fine particle in illa maybe for three to four months and then again see if they improve. So because this is a, a patient who has got a predominant small airway obstruction and by giving the treatment uh, by just giving the correct treatment by ultrafine particle inhalers, maybe this patient actually can improve. So this has got treatment outcomes as to what treatment you can deploy and oscillometry actually assist in this very well to know the level of obstruction, whether it is central or peripheral. So of course, this is a case of both peripheral and central obstruction, which would be much more in cases of COPD. Uh, so we come to COPD. So this is a trumpet, trumpet sign, which is there in both uh, when obstruction is both central and, and also peripheral. Uh, more so reactance curve has gone down. So uh, probably smoker or COPD patients or maybe a patient of asthma, but not much of reversibility. So maybe more so cases of COPD. Uh, this is his this was his spirometry this was her spirometry 
and as I said that oscillometry is very sensitive for detecting early COPD and, and shows abnormality much more often than a spirometry. Uh, the spirometry is normal in this patient but when you do oscillometry you see this reactance curve or X5 is deflected downwards and this is very typical of a COPD when you observe the curves and when you see these oscillographs uh, often and on a daily basis you would pick up these curves and, uh, and their abnormality just like that without seeing the absolute values which uh, which are there and, and and same thing we used to do for the also spirometry. So this X5 deflection is very typical of COPD as we can see and this patient we also did a CT scan because his spirometry was normal and this and then we did HRCT chest and it indeed showed some changes of smoking in fact early smoking related interstitial fibrosis and also mild loss respiratory bronchitis and we confirmed this because we got facility of this also lung lung also density analysis software from MBIO and this also showed uh, actually presence of low density areas with bilateral low low predominance correlating with the HRCT finding and also oscillometry of non-destructive centrosinal emphysematous changes. So this is what oscillometry can do is an excellent example to correlate the findings. Uh, as I said early COPD so you see the deflection in the X5 this curve so you should look at this this is very typical of COPD that resistance at X5 uh, is affected uh, quite early and hence we can detect this see again this is another example of early COPD see the deflection of X5 downwards uh, and of course as against asthma you will see the reversity in COPD which is partial so it won't be that much so we got some cutoff values which are there for reversibility uh, for oscillometry and uh, in this case it is not that much so this is a partiality in a patient uh, who who has got partiality or obstructive AV disease uh, now a lot of question asked about whether oscillometry can also detect actually restrictive pattern or more so in ILD patients. So initially we didn't have much of data but now data is has come into the literature where uh, we are actually detecting this and simple if we have got history of the patient this is not a smoker has got no history of asthma or any obstructive disease and you see a curve which has got this normal resistance and abnormal reactance as this is the case this is is, this is the patient of patient and is, uh, this is patient's spirometry uh, which is which clearly detects it it is a restrictive curve and you see this oscillometry that resistance is normal R5, R20 they are all in green but AX and X5 are affected so in a patient in whom you have got a good history if you see this case then maybe you can actually suspect interstitial lung disease and actually you can and if this is a restrictive pattern uh, going further now we have got uh, now intra analysis and we have got X5 also values so you tease out it's in, into uh, the breadth into inspiration and expiration and you can have the parameters of oscillometry being being measured in these two in these two phases of respiration and by knowing the difference between these we can detect so we employ we see x5 values in inspiration and expiration and in case of interstitial lung disease or when you have a restrictive pattern and you see that x5 inspiratory is more than x5 expiratory then this may be a case of interstitial lung disease and uh, now also we are also generating further data and studies are coming and maybe this would be established as the parameter to also detect interstitial lung disease. Uh, and to conclude, uh, as I was saying, I had opportunity to do oscillometry also in patients who had done uh, who had undergone lung transplant. And this is a big article which came in the Blue Journal in 2020, which said that airway oscillometry detects spirometric silent episodes of acute cellular rejection which are quite early and you can diagnose actually lung transplant rejection 
by actually knowing this ACR quite early and uh, this article concluded that our observation and the ease of conducting oscillometry provide a solid and compelling rationale for incorporating oscillometry as an adjunct to spirometry for patients monitoring after lung transplant and in a particular to those patients or in centers that do not perform routine surveillance bronchoscopy with transbronchial biopsy, which is an invasive procedure. So oscillometry can facilitate identification of acute cell rejection and hence of response to treatment can actually save that lung. And it could ultimately help stratify patients' risk with respect to the clinical outcomes. And this was the case that we got of lung transplant uh, had, uh, and the values to see it is AX and XY. So these values are in fact important uh, when you have this lung transplant patient and see that it's been affected. This patient had indeed a problem. We did a surveillance bronchoscopy and there was basically a problem this patient there was obstruction and we could detect and then we could basically also uh, transfer this information to the lung transplant physician and and then hopefully we can take corrective steps so these are some of the case histories or case which i have picked up from my own practice and this is a beginner's thing and I would suggest uh, all of you to, and then of a yogurt oscillometry in your own clinic hospital, you should try to do both actually, both I mean together. Uh, maybe you can, have, maybe when you're learning, you can also subsidize your oscillometry cost. That's what I did. I used to do oscillometry free of cost uh, first, actually, before doing my recruiting spirometries and I used to correlate the findings and, and then you learn very fast and I would say that basically you should do both and they should be done in house conjunction and you can get more and more values. It adds to the value if you do both the thing, both both oscillometry and spirometry together as, as, as information you get is immense and as you learn you would know that how it can help in your clinical practice to also manage your patients. Thank you. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajesh. All those cases have really uh, been helpful. You know, the cases, the graphs which you showed, I think real life, life scenarios are very important for any of us to understand technology. So uh, I'm, sh I'm getting lots and lots of questions. And uh, we'll, I'll just introduce two of the panelists who are going to be joining us now. Uh, we have with us Professor Dr. Ravi Dosi. He is the head of department, Department of Respiratory Medicine at Kokila Ben Dhirubhai Ambani Hospital at Indore MP. He was initially as the head of department at SAMC PGI Indore MP. He is awarded with many awards, the IMA Best Teacher Award 2020, the Best Young Physician Award, Padma Shri, Dr. SM Mukherjee Award, and has many publications in Index Journal always very active and also well known for his YouTube exploits of creating health awareness uh, videos and so on and so forth. So welcome Dr. Ravi and we have with us uh, a young dynamic pulmonologist Dr. Mandeep Kaur Sodhi. She is MD pulmonary medicine, DNB pulmonary medicine and presently the assistant professor uh, Department of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at the Government Medical College Hospital Sector 32 Chandigarh. Member of many associations, international, national, very active in academics. And of course, we'll be sharing, uh, she will be sharing her experiences with the oscillometer. So without further delay, we have got a few, some amount of questions, which I need to definitely ask our panelists. So uh, uh, Ravi, just to open from your end, you know, when before we start, were planning to this, do this panel discussion, Rajesh is live now. He had sent me a text message three days back. Never call it iOS. You should call it oscillometry. It's like using a Xerox as a word for a copier. So, so I'm just going to ask you a simple question. We hear of FOT. We hear of iOS. So what exactly are the differences and what is the technical difference in this? So basically, uh, FOT was the initial technique whereby sound waves were used at fixed frequencies, particularly like let's say 5, 10 and 30. 
and uh, they were transmitted and uh, the the properties were measured uh, whereas in impulse oscillometry a whole range of frequencies is uh, given uh, multiple impulses are given and the properties are measured at all the frequencies in the lung okay no <laughs> sorry <laughs> dr leonard yes please yeah no um uh, th th this is a source for for misunderstanding um and um the iOS device delivers or tries to deliver square waves. Now, if you know anything about um, square waves, they are made up of an almost infinite number of frequencies and a lot of high frequencies. Otherwise, you could, wouldn't get the sharp, quick rise in the in the um, initial of the, the, the pulse. So the way they do it is that every point two seconds they deliver such a pulse one in one out one in one out so the basic frequency by which the speaker because it's a speaker membrane being shifted back and forth is every point two seconds which is five hertz right so when you do this with a speaker membrane you will also generate the harmonics of five hertz and as uh, sandip selvi discussed before you will then have this harmonic interference at all the multiple frequencies of five. So 10, 15, 20, 25, and so on and so forth. Um, the power spectrum is not controlled. The only thing they control is really that the speaker flips back and forth. So they have no control over the power of, uh, of the, um, of the um, signal going in. It's probably a lot stronger than any of the other devices be that until you arrest mono tremor flow, because it's not controlled. They don't have any feedback. So what sets that apart from, from the multi-frequency oscillometry that we're using these days, on which all the modern devices are based on, is that we do have a much higher precision control on the flow, pressure, and volume. We produce continuous sine waves, meaning that we're measuring continuously over the whole time not only when the pulse appears. Um, we use prime numbers. Prime numbers are important because then you avoid all those harmonic interferences. And so you will have a much higher quality signal. Um, the frequencies cover the range of interest. We don't have any unnecessary frequencies going behind or, or below. So we, we don't create a lot of, of noise um, using the... the uh, the, uh, the 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 well-defined uh, sine waves. Another thing, we can also control the amplitudes for all the individual frequencies. We produce the highest power at the lowest frequency, five hertz in most cases, right? Then you scale that roughly inversely to the um, frequency content. Sort of a bit technical here, but the the question was such, right? And that you do that so that you retain the exact the same power at a frequency of, say, 19 as the frequency of 5 hertz. And you do that by scaling it inversely to the frequency. Um, <clears throat> so all of this <clears throat> just generates a much higher quality uh, signal going in. It also allows for a much um, better analysis because you know exactly what you put in you know exactly what should come back out. So if something else comes out, you know it wasn't my signal. So you can you can eliminate that from from the analysis. Um, <clears throat> so um, I think all of these things just generate a much better quality um, device. <clears throat> that being said, iOS was a wonderful invention back in the late 1980s when it was invented, and <clears throat> you have to remember that they didn't have the computers we have today so they were limited to what they could do so a pulse would sort of limit the the number of 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 data points they had to analyze because now you have space between you have 2.2 seconds space between each and every pulse which allowed the, the computers at the time to actually crunch the numbers today we can actually do the same thing with a continuous sine wave um uh, and and um, so yeah we we do have we had we do have a much uh, higher quality these days that's yeah. essentially what it boils down to yeah yeah thank you thank you so much for that uh, explanation dr salvi sir that uh, uh, 
you know there is a question which is coming up about the uh, in pre operative because we generally apply spirometry even in surgeries for fitness so how do we use that in terms of oscillometry good, good question uh, i'm not aware of any good study that has <clears throat> evaluated the role of oscillometry for pre operative fitness now my logic tells me that whenever you want to operate a patient uh maybe it's a thoracic surgery or an abdominal surgery lung volumes will probably be more important and relevant than your resistance and your reactance uh that we find on oscillometry so i would rather use spirometry for a pre operative fitness or pre operative evaluation uh oscillometry there's no study as of now so until we get that uh, until we develop that science i don't think we should recommend that thank you so that clarification was important because almost five six questions had come regarding how do we evaluate mm -hmm. about operation surgery pre operative so mandeep uh, you know we have already had a couple of talks but again there are few uh, clarifications needed from our audience that if i have to differentiate asthma and copd based on a oscillometry what parameters and how should i you know pick up small pointers to understand so just make it a very simple explanation for them maybe a summary of whatever the slides were shown asthma and copd in terms of oscillometry okay good evening everyone uh, so basically as very beautifully explained by dr salvi we uh, ideally both are obstructive airway diseases but basically in asthma there is a mixture to start with in a pure asthma phenotype it is a large airway obstruction so the resistance at all the frequencies is going to increase we will see that there will be an increase in the r5 there will be an increase also in the r20 because the central airways are involved you know earlier also the difference in r5 r20 would be there but that would be not very great whereas in copd what we see is that uh since the small airways are predominantly involved so r20 first of all would be uh, in the normal range very close to normal r5 would increase and the difference between the two that is r5 and r20 is going to be a very big value also in copd the reactance is one parameter that you know shifts more uh, compared to resistance so if we compare with asthma the uh, parameter that dominates in copd is reactance also when we do the post bronchodilator studies the uh, asthma patients will show a very good reversibility you know r20 that is the large airway obstruction almost disappears it is it comes down to the pre bronchodilator levels r5 decreases as well whereas uh, in copd the levels would decrease that is a kind of a partial reversibility so that is uh, when i'm talking about you know a purely asthma phenotype not a mixed or not something with airway modeling sir absolutely so fine at least that gives a rough idea you know because the the ones who are in just starting off doing an oscillometry they will be more easier to understand this concept so coming ravi back to you uh, also we have got certain questions which are being asked on what's the role of oscillometry in upper and the central airway obstruction and you know how does it uh, uh, help us is it anything on that any pointers you want to put on that uh basically if uh, in upper airway obstruction uh, there is a rise in all the resistance parameters there is in uh, central airway obstruction the r5 r20 difference would be maintained uh, only the r5 and r20 will be less okay uh dr lenard since you have done lot of work on uh, school going children you know Uh, we are seeing that almost a good number of people who have developed asthma later actually start off with allergic rhinitis and that is also a very common symptom in the school going age group so do you have any such data where children with allergic rhinitis were actually screened by oscillometry and where it was found if they they were they were not yet diagnosed to have asthma but the oscillometry picked up the obstructive airway disease in them I'm not sure if there is this distinct this, this study in children particularly, but um, I have uh, there are studies in in adults at least showing that rhinitis allergic rhinitis tend to bleed over into the lungs as well. Um, now in I'm not sure how it is in India, but in a lot of of countries there is a strong separation between ear ear throat nose doctors and lung doctors, right? So. 
the, the people looking at, at the, the the head parts sort of of the airways, they don't really think much about the lungs. Uh, I think if we could put oscillometry devices in their hands and and ask them to to check the lungs just randomly, you probably would pick up a lot of people who do actually, unbeknownst to themselves, um, issues with with the with the lung health. Um, I we have um, a study. I'm know a study in in California in in young children starting from age two up to age seven. They were admitted into the study. Uh, by their GPs, uh, presuming that they were well controlled, all based on either spirometry in in the cases kids could do spirometry, or just by by um, uh, you know the, the usual um, you know uh, auscultation of the of the kid, and then they were tested with oscillometry in the study, and they found that somewhere between fifty and sixty percent of the kids presumed by the GPs being well controlled were actually not well controlled. They still had strong signs of small airways disease. So, you know, I think children is is really an under underserved uh, population in in uh, in um, uh, airways diseases. So thank thank you for that. Uh, Mandeep, I wanted to ask you that, uh, you know, now oscillometry is helping us to identify small airway disease and Sir also mentioned about small airway disease asthma. In your practice, have you actually found that there is an increase, you are detecting much more and that is one question. One Secondly, if you are detecting and you start them with the usage of extra fine particulate, when is the good time to repeat oscillometry? Okay. So basically, uh, you know, in our OPDs, we uh, many a times have patients who have got the symptoms. There is MMRC, dyspnea grade 2, they may be smokers, but the spirometry when done, that comes out to be normal. So those are the cases where we have found that, you know, impulse oscillometry uh, can definitely help to, you know, pick up the early lung changes, the small airway obstruction much more earlier than spirometry. Uh, which is also a positive reinforcing effect for the patient to stop smoking because it serves as a danger sign for that patient. Also, uh, once the detection is done, uh, there is very good role of the targeted therapy that is being talked about these days. We have the Nivioli inhaler and the extra fine uh, formulations that we say. And uh, uh, I think there are no clear cut rules, but we usually like to do it after 12 weeks or like three months of treatment, you know? Yeah. Correct. I think that would be a good time to clinically assess plus see the change in the physiological obstruction which comes in. Uh, coming to Ravi, there's a question in the chat box which talks about, uh, I think someone has messaged me that there's a seven-month-old pregnant lady and we are suspecting she has got obstructive airway disease. Can we go ahead with the oscillometry in pregnancy? Well, uh, if, if the clinical need is there, sir, I, I have not been able to find out any contraindication to that. I think if needed, it can be gone. Uh, we can go ahead with IS in such a situation. Sir. So, yeah, so any, sir. any contraindication for oscillometry? Uh, yes, sir, as I was as I was yes. saying, in fact, there is no contraindication to oscillometry and all those contraindications that exist for spirometry are not there for that because we are also using oscillometry in our ICU patients and also patients who are also basically ventilators. Right. right? So, 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 so then I think any, any anyone who can breathe, as I said, uh, I think uh, can do oscillometry and there is no absolute contraindication. And of course, pregnant ladies are one of uh, a very good indication in which you can deploy oscillometry instead of spirometry. If, and and, and, then of course, and then of course, if she's just six or seven months pregnant, you know, so that is, uh, I think, a better tool. And I, I, and I, we should do that. We should so, deploy oscillometry. So, so Rajesh, since you are in the firing line, I want to ask you a question now. Uh, if someone is asking which which one to buy, would you sir, sub, tell them about a particular? <laughs> so there is a lot of conflict of interest here with us, in fact, here. So that question should be best avoided. <laughs> but <laughs> because, you know, we've been using our, uh, our various oscillometer. But, but then, of course, basically, uh, about 10 years back, we just had one only. And then you had also mentioned IS or master screen that was made by Eager. And now... It is outdated, in fact. So they are not even servicing their uh, their uh, oscillometries now. But I think lately, in last about ten years, and I think India is quite lucky enough to have I think three or four devices, 
and the range is quite good. So basically, you can get from three lakhs to about ten lakhs. So right. it depends what is your practice. In fact, whether you are also doing periodic practice and whether you are doing uh, whether you need a portable device, how much how much how much portability you need, uh, and and then you should look at the cost of it, uh, and and then and then also recovery of it. In fact, uh, in initial practice, if you got a very good practice, then you can you can then go for a higher version. In fact, and uh, which is good one, and then you should also look at the cost uh, of 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 the recurrence cost. In fact, for the load test, how much is the expiry uh, and and I think all those things. So all this thing has to be done. But 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 then anyone which is available are quite good in fact and and I think just to begin with I think you can take anyone uh, and and at least begin and then after you can go for a higher version once you know that this uh, how it works. Yeah, yeah, so that's absolutely well answered, politically correct and generally correct. So it's a it's a good answer. You know the the uh, doctor three D he's a senior pulmonologist. He just made a comment that we are talking so much of small airway disease, but. How is the pharma company? Only one of them has got actually a, a ultra fine particulate, or a, you know that that's a real surprise because we need something to really treat these small airway diseases with a good deposition at that uh, instance. So uh, coming to last couple of questions because it's we are already overshot the time, and I think uh, ICS Doctor Sarvi sir, you need to arrange part two. <laughs> <laughs> in the next, <laughs> next month. But before we end up, last uh, couple of questions. One is to Dr. Mandeep. See, the again, there are a few doubts about in spirometry, we know mild, moderate, severe. We always try to understand that. How do we go ahead about that in oscillometry for asthma, COPD? How do we do that? Uh, so as far as I'm aware, uh, as of now, there are no clear-cut values to distinguish uh, mild, moderate, severe in case of obstructive or restrictive diseases. Although some machines have got these machine learning algorithms, which are giving these stages, which are automated. But uh, like if we just see the indexes as such. So in asthma, what we see is that there was one study which showed that uh, except for the central airway resistance, R20, which did not change across all severities of asthma, the other parameters like, you know, R5, R20, X5 and AX, they uh, subsequently, uh, you know, increased and became more abnormal as the disease progressed. Similarly, for COPD that we have data from the Eclipse cohort. Now that showed that uh, as the disease progressed from gold stage two to four, the greatest change that they saw was in the area of reactants because that is the part that is the peripheral airway and the lung that is compliance, which is more affected. So the change was as good as 136%. And similarly in ILD, I think uh, X5 values would give a better parameter of the progression of the disease. But yes, there are no clear cut values that I am aware of till now. Yeah. So, so I think, so yeah. I think there's been studies which have correlated AX values with gold or guidelines of COPD. So, you know, there was a study and, and, and then as Leonard would also say that AX, you know, 10 and then of 10 to 20, 20 to 40. So they have got, they got this correlation with this gold Gold then also stage one, two, three, and uh, I mean four, but not as much. So, as I said, you have to basically also do uh, your PFT test and and then also your basic spirometry. I mean, you can't do everything with oscillometry now. And of course, yeah. when you do together, you can get more information against doing one thing alone. Right. So, so possibly, yeah. possibly that that another three few people who have put why isn't it in the guidelines? Why is it not in the guidelines? I think no one. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I think I think so. I think no, I should I, ask Sadhvi. Doctor Sadhvi should answer this question. He is in gold and Gina <laughs> guidelines as well. So I think he would be telling us the inside story that why we are not generating so much of data. And for you, you also have, I also know that now for papers have increased. Why it is yeah. there is there is not just a single line of oscillometry in either of the guidelines. Yeah. I, I, no, I, I think general. I think what we sorry if, if, if I, will, I will let you speak. I, I think. What we are doing here today, or actually what the Indian Chess Society is doing here today, is is fantastic because all of these things, changes in guidelines, recommendations from authorities, acceptance for reimbursement, all of those things has to come from the ground up. This is nothing that industry or a few KOLs can sort of impose on on insurance companies or on governments to to accept. This is something that has to come from the ground up, and I think give, getting. Um, the support of the Indian Chess Society for a good cause is one example of this, which I think is one of the reasons that India is actually one of the places where oscillometry is being accepted and used a lot in the clinical setting. Whereas if you go to the more traditional 
areas of Europe and Northern America. It's very much a research tool. And so we see, you know, it depends on how you start the whole process, right? Uh, and, and when it comes to cutoffs, yes, I think we will eventually end up there. And I know there are studies in asthma in children going on here in Montreal, uh, looking at that. We had that uh, sort of feeble attempt that I and Dr. Dandron did a few years ago with, with COPD. That was sort of an example of what could perhaps be done. Nobody has picked up the, the, that uh, thread yet, but I think it will come. Uh, yeah. Sorry, so, so, Dr. Rajesh, to answer that, it will mm -hmm. get into the guidelines eventually. I did speak to the chairman of uh, GINA and said, you know, sad asthma is becoming such an important phenotype yeah. in clinical practice. Why is there no attempt to mention something about it in the GINA document? So the answer that she gave was very simple. She said, Sandeep, yes, sad asthma is becoming very popular and very, very important. But as of now, there is no good treatment. At least there are no randomized controlled trials to show that sad asthma can be treated effectively with a particular drug. So until the therapeutic evidence is seen clinically through good randomized controlled trials, we cannot uh, in we cannot include it in the GINA just as a you know very nice thing for the future, but it has to have practical application. And the same thing for COPD as well. Until we have ultrafine particles that can target the small airways. And the studies show that it actually creates benefit. It'll it'll take time for it to get into the guidelines, but I'm sure eventually it will. I think oscillometry is becoming very popular yeah. uh, in, in most parts of the world now. So it's just a matter of time. Yeah. So last word on it, Ravi. One last question, then we wind up. Uh, if you are given a choice, you see a patient in your OPD. You have got both the machines and had a spirometry and oscillometry. You see the patient and you say, no, this patient has to undergo an oscillometry only, not a spirometry. So which would be those one, two, three, four, who are very much characteristically should be put up for, are indicated for oscillometry, not for a spirometry? Well, uh, sir, patients whom I feel will not be able to follow the protocol of spirometry, like children, uh, elderly, uh, who will be finding it difficult to perform the conventional spirometry, I would prefer an IOS. Definitely in conditions where uh, I feel there is a suspicion that it is too early, like maybe conditions like pre-COPD or maybe a lung transplant scenario where we are suspecting a potential rejection. In such sort of a patient, I would like to go in for a spir uh, IOS definitely. And uh, uh, suppose we have an infant or an ICU patient like Rajesh Swankarsar told, in such conditions, spirometry is out of the question, but IOS would be a definite indication. Wonderful. So I think we have covered an exhaustive, uh, you know, topic, though many things yet to be answered. I have got another th one dozen questions, which I told Dr. Sarvi's are next webinar, we can take them. But I am I heartily thank all the wonderful speakers, Dr. Lena, Dr. Sarvi, Dr. Rajesh, Dr. Ravi, Dr. Mandeep, everyone. And of course, uh, Indian Chess Society for getting this initiative on. Thankful all the listeners who have logged in throughout the program, though it has been much more than the timing which was expected. And of course, Lupin for being there and helping us out with the technological backup. So with that, we thank you all. And I thank all the wonderful STM panelists and speakers once again. Good night, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Salil, for a wonderful thank moderation. Thank you. Thank you, Salil. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.